at sea, or on the land, or in the air, the struggle to survive is constant. The biggest threat to all of nature is undeniably man, and as such, we play out our role in a world where all that lives are predators and prey. It has been described as an unholy monster. From the deepest corners of the planet's oceans comes the octopus. Terrifying to some, comforting to others. It provides one of the world's great mysteries. You're about to experience the mystery that is embraced in the arms of the octopus. These are encounters at the bottom of the sea. You don't have to be a deep sea diver or scientist to appreciate the suppleness of this creature of the deep. But the divers and researchers are thrilled not only by the aesthetics of these movements, but also by all the new information being generated by the careful observation of the octopus. Experts in behavioral research realize that here in the deep they are being confronted by one of the most intelligent creatures among those categorized as invertebrates, animals with no backbone. The octopus amazes you with the uncanny ability to adapt to the colors of his surroundings. Just like the soldier who uses camouflage to hide among his prey, the octopus is able to change colors to suit its needs, whether it is to hunt or to defend against being hunted. The octopus belongs to the family of cephalopods. The Latin term octopus refers to the eight tentacles. Much like birds, the octopus has a beak. Much like a snake, the octopus is able to inject a paralyzing poison into its prey. But the octopus is also like a chameleon, able to change color at will. And the octopus has eyes like mammals. It is hard to imagine that with all these characteristics, the octopus belongs to the simplest of living beings, the invertebrates. But perhaps this is why the octopus has always been underestimated. Octopus a la carte. For most people, the octopus has little significance at the eating table, except in the dining rooms of the Mediterranean, where it is a culinary specialty, appreciated by the Mediterranean gourmet. The truth is very few members of the cephalopod family are edible. Their preparation demands an intensive tenderizing of those muscular arms because the taste buds might not be turned on if the teeth have too much work to do. Getting back to the sea, the octopus is the master of the art of camouflage. The question becomes, is a form of communication between octopus and man even possible? While mating, the males put on a fascinating performance. They swim around restlessly, displaying their luminous colors. The male was able to find a consenting female. She also signals her intentions by a change of colors, though not as obvious as the bright colors of the male. The ritual of copulation begins. During mating, the male is in a state of high excitement. There is a discharge of spermatophores. Up to 200,000 eggs have already matured in the female's body cavity and are now being fertilized. During penetration, the spermatophores are transmitted through a groove connecting the male with the female. The spermatophores are received in the female's oviduct and it is there that they are stored in a gland the mating process is lengthy. It can take several hours. Nature, however, decrees that both will die shortly after the mating. The female may lay her eggs in as little as three weeks or as long as three months after fertilization. The strings of eggs are hung from the ceilings of caves in such a way as to allow a continuous supply of oxygen. During the period of incubation, the female stops eating 
and keeps a constant watch over her spawn. The crucial incubation period is now complete. The baby octopuses tear through the tissue surrounding them and emerge into the water. The female must call upon her final reserves of energy to push the young ones out of the hole. It is important to be able to spawn so many baby octopuses because only a few will survive. The fish which are stationed near the entrance will attack the young ones. Nature decrees that in the ongoing cycle of birth and death, less than 1% of the offspring will survive. Now the final act in the life of the female octopus has begun. The brood has hatched. She has exhausted all her strength, and she expels her last weak breath and dies. The number one enemy of the octopus is the grouper. When the octopus is frightened and trying to escape, it will shoot out clouds of ink from the gill cavity. This inky cloud will obstruct the vision of the grouper, and it will also confuse his sense of smell. Trying to get away from the camera, the octopus winds up in the home of an eel. The eel is wasting no time in biting the octopus. This attack is carried out with lightning speed. However, the octopus has an astonishing ability to recover. It is able to regenerate the tentacles that have been injured, sometimes even severed. The eight tentacles have suction cups. They surround the head of the octopus in a star-shaped manner. The sucker discs are arranged in longitudinal rows and develop enormous strength. They act as vacuums. This experiment demonstrates that the octopus will turn those suction cups to the outside as a sign of subordination when confronted by the enemy. The leather-like mantle cavity attached to the head of the octopus is a complex membrane which encloses the animal's viscera. In the center lies the funnel. During inhalation, the mantle cavity expands and water is circulated over the animal's gills. When exhaling, the mantle contracts and water is expelled through the funnel tube. One very interesting peculiarity in the anatomy of the octopus is the fact that the animal has not one, but two gills. Each gill is supplied with oxygen by its own heart. But the octopus, which has one heart for each gill, also has a third heart, which supports the remaining blood circulation. It takes three hearts to pump the blood and the oxygen throughout the body of this fascinating creature. The eyes of the cephalopods bear a very strong resemblance to those of vertebrates, animals with backbones. Man is a vertebrate, and just like man, the octopus has eyelids, irises, and retinas. The black rectangular bar which is sitting across the center of the octopus's eye has a tendency to remain horizontal, regardless of the body's position. Octopuses are able to contract the muscles of their mantle, expelling water in the body cavity through the funnel tube, which constitutes their method of jet propulsion they take off like a rocket. Octopuses are sensitive. They inhabit a world of perceptions and sensations that man cannot possibly perceive. One of their most prominent attributes is homochromatism. This is the ability to change color in relation to their surroundings or to express differing moods. The agents of these color changes are the chromatophores, the color cells. In the animal kingdom, these cells are unique to the octopus. Each chromatophore is attached to the muscle fibers which control the cell when they're stimulated to contract or expand. The chromatophore spreads out into a flat disc, exposing pigments, providing a dominant color. When relaxed, the chromatophore will be restored to its original round form. All this is triggered by a highly developed nervous system with a unique ability to adapt to its surroundings. The octopus is able to change the color of even the smallest parts of its body, in this case, around the eyes. But it's not only the color, even the surface of the skin is constantly undergoing change. In just an instant, 
the smooth and supple skin will be covered with spots and bumps. This blending with the environment is perfect. When in need of defense, the masquerade will also not fail to have a threatening effect on the enemy. In the center of those tentacles lies the mouth of the octopus. The yellow tongue has a rough surface and its prey are injected at close range by a spurt of paralyzing venom from the salivary glands of the octopus. The beak and tongue complete the process of pulverization. In this case, a crayfish is placed in a glass jar closed with a cork. A small hole has been drilled through the cork The octopus discovers the prey and slowly explores the invisible glass walls. Bit by bit, its body covers the jar. The prey is found, and the arms work relentlessly to grasp it. Each of the octopus's eight arms can be controlled individually. Each performs a different task from the others. It's much like an assembly line. The prey is passed from one suction cup to the next finally reaching the mouth. The crayfish is pulled into the center of the tentacles. After the first bite, the venom of the octopus will quickly paralyze it. Seattle, Washington, a seaport on the Pacific coast of the U.S. Here in the icy waters of Puget Sound lies the home of the giant octopus. The environment provides the ideal setting for biologists and behavioral researchers. One of them is John Eddy. In one of the exhibits, we're uh taking an octopus from uh, a tub that we have behind the scenes and have him climb into a small tank that's on wheels. And then we take the tank up to give the talk, let people uh, touch the octopus and ask questions about it, and then drag the tank back and let him climb into his uh, normal holding tub behind the scenes. Eddie and his fellow scientists from the Biological Institute prepare their diving gear to take us to the realm of the giant octopus in Puget Sound. The marine landscape is unique in this area. Rare plants and sea creatures have settled in the cold and fast-moving water. This environment is a favorable terrain for the octopus. In the ocean, the straits marked by tidal rhythm and strong currents provide excellent hiding places. The water is unusually rich in plankton. Crabs, shrimp, and other crustaceans pray that the octopus treasures are abundant. Two huge mating starfish lie at the bottom of the sea. Divers discovered two octopuses in the darkness. Once a year, the animals come into shallow water to mate and spawn. Those who were unsuccessful in their search of a mate retreat to deeper water. The arms of the octopus can be elongated considerably, in this case reaching a span of six meters. Their movements are slower than those of the smaller Mediterranean octopus. We are being fixed with a look that is not easily broken. The surface of the skin is bristly with outgrowths. Inflated, riding on gigantic arms, the octopus strides across the ocean floor. White scars on the surface of the skin are remnants of previous ferocious battles fought over mates. 
Caution must be exercised because scientists from the Marine Aquarium in Seattle have been reporting large bites and wounds. The octopus of legend is not just a figment of the imagination, it is a living reality. These suction cups are impressive, some of them as large as saucers. A scientist approaches the creature. With empathy bordering on tenderness, he tries to loosen the animal's grip. Once success is achieved, the octopus comes out into the open water. Eye to eye with this unique, tremendous animal, a strange game develops. The octopus shows no signs of aggression, although it does possess the power to hold a ton with its mighty suction cups. In this demonstration, the play shows no signs of mistrust. The creature, which has been portrayed as a great enemy of man, is in reality displaying signs of subordination to the human animal. The octopus at play even consents to the presence of a rival, just as his superior wishes. To gain more insight into the way of life of the gigantic octopus, these biologists are trying to catch one. The intensive play is meant to tire out the creature, and they tire relatively easily. That's because of their blue-green blood. They have a great deal of blood, and it is driven by a powerful heart. But the respiratory pigmentation which fixes the oxygen in the blood is not the same as hemoglobin. Hemoglobin gives human blood its color. There is no iron in the composition of the blood in the octopus. No iron, only copper. It is not as effective in carrying oxygen as iron. Human blood can absorb three to five times as much oxygen as the blood of the cephalopods. This enormous oxygen requirement explains why the giant octopus constantly exists at the outer limits of its respiratory potential. Now to a different setting, the Caribbean, home to the smaller octopuses that are conspicuous because of their behavior. During ebb tide, they remain in rock pools, pockets of water in the tidal flats that are as deep as two meters. Why do the octopuses undertake this difficult journey through the rocky surf? There appears to be very little food there, and it does seem desolate and even dangerous. So why do they prefer to live in these water holes rather than out in the open sea. How do they survive? The camera lens spots the first tentacle. Everything seems to indicate that these caves are simply being used as hiding places. That, in fact, turns out to be the answer. When daybreak meets the Caribbean, sharks begin the hunt. An octopus looking for nourishment in the reef doesn't stand a chance. The giant octopus, however, does not have to fear the shark. But while the shark is rarely a problem, the whale is a much different story. The giant octopus often falls prey to the killer whales that pass the northwest coast of America during the mating season. How do they survive? Scientists are trying to answer these probing questions. And as our cameras say goodbye to these underwater creatures, we are left to ask ourselves, how is it that myth and reality can live side by side comfortably in the human mind? The answer to that question may be the ultimate result of encounters at the bottom of the sea. I'm Charles Adler.